Hello, I'm Ann Gritch, and I am delighted to welcome you to this uh, segment of our new video series uh, for the 40th anniversary of the Diocese of San Jose. Bishop Oscar Cantu, our bishop, has requested um, us to interview representatives from the uh, various cultural and ethnic groups in the diocese. So we are right now uh, at Five Wounds Na Portuguese National Church in San Jose. We are outside because of the COVID-19 and we are uh, six feet apart, uh, but we are without masks so that we can have a good conversation. With me are three members, very uh, active members of Five Wounds Church. Um, Lisa Berry and Lucia Sores and Miguel Avila. So welcome to the three of you. Um, Five Wounds Church, from what I remember and from what I understand, it was uh, dedicated in 1919. So it's one of the older churches in the diocese. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, maybe Miguel, can you tell us a little bit of the history of this beautiful building? Sure, so in November 1914, um, the parish was established by the Archdiocese of San Francisco. So it took about five years to, uh, to build this beautiful building. Um, took, you, we have to get into the context of the time. So 1914, World War I going on. So uh, prices were going through the roof to try to get workers here and materials to build the church. So uh, it took quite a bit of time to, uh, to build the church. And then finally it was dedicated in July, 1919. But there then a large po uh, Portuguese community. Is that why the decision was made to start the parish? So interesting enough, th there were already Portuguese communities built in Milpitas. At St. John the Baptist was huh? actually founded by Portuguese families. No kidding, huh? And at St. Clair's in Santa Clara. Yes, right. So, um, so Monsignor Ribeiro, who was the founder of the parish and the church, mm -hmm. um, decided to do it in more of a neutral location. Yeah. So uh, more <laughs> like, if you build it, they will come. And so his vision was really to establish a uh, Portuguese community around the church in, here in East San Jose. And he succeeded. He has. No, it's wonderful. Tell me about the, in fact, Lisa, tell me about the parish community. Well, the parish uh, community is actually quite diverse. It has a very um, strong Portuguese identity, which actually really draws people to the church. Um, the beauty and the elegance, and the elegant way that they, um, the processions are done, um, the style of worship, there's just nothing like this. Having been um, grown up Protestant, um, and spending most of my life as a Protestant and looking around for a Catholic Church, this fit everything that um, that I was hoping to find with the um, um, just the beautiful reverence here, just the beautiful loving community, all of the activities that go on here and just the incredible love of this community is very welcoming to all different ethnicities. We have a number of different ethnicities at this church and they're all encouraged to be involved and um, brought in and become part of this community. It's very special. You know, you were talking about um, some of the, the devotions and all. Lucia, can you tell me particularly the devotions that are special to the Portuguese community? There are quite a few. Mm -hmm. And uh, this church was founded by, as Miguel was saying, Monsignor Ribeiro from the Azores. Uh -huh. It's a group of islands in the middle of the Atlantic yeah. Ocean. And each island had its own devotions ah. to specific saints, etc. And so when those immigrants came to this church, they brought a lot of those traditions. One of the biggest traditions is the devotion to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. In Portugal, there is a tradition around uh, Queen St. Isabel, who was a queen of Portugal, yep. and a miracle that she uh, performed, she turned bread into roses. Yep. And the whole theme is around feeding the poor and helping the poor. And so we have that tradition here, in, and it's manifested in the processions of the Holy Spirit. We have uh, girls who are queens representing St. Isabel, and we also feed for free 
during that day, anyone who comes to the church, we feed them uh, a meal of bread and meat. It's called sopaj. It doesn't sound amazing, but it tastes amazing. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's one of the biggest traditions. And then, of course, we have traditions related to saints. For example, um, we have the Bon Jesus Festa about Jesus. We also have various Our Lady of Fatima celebrations. Uh, as you know, Our Lady well, she appeared. She would be big, Our Lady of Fatima. Yeah. Yes, Our Lady appeared in 1917, right. uh, just when this church was, was coming built. to be. That's right. And wow. so every month on the 13th from May to October, we have a special mass. And this year, related to COVID, we did things a little bit differently that mm. I, I wanted to highlight. So every year on May the 13th or the weekend around that, we would have a procession around the church and the whole community would get involved in the prayer of the rosary, etc. This year, because of COVID, we could not get a big group of people to process around the church. So instead, we created a, a virtual program, including a piece where we had the rosary said over Zoom in five different languages to represent the ethnicities of our community. And we also had what we call the reverse procession, where we took the statue of Our Lady of Fatima and we put it in a car and we processed around the neighborhoods and video streamed the procession and it was one of the most moving events that our church has experienced as we saw our lady drive in the neighborhoods people were outside waving crying and receiving the love that our mother was giving us in such a difficult time so we've adapted those traditions with the new ethnic groups in our community and also expressing still that that portuguese missionary spirit to bring our faith to all communities that is wonderful Oh, I can imagine that that procession with the cars must have been quite wonderful. Yeah. Um, music. What's, tell me about Portuguese music. <laughs> I'll start off, and I think Lisa could probably ch chime in here. Um, we have different choirs for different masses. We have masses in English and in Portuguese. We have choirs of immigrants, you know, still Portuguese immigrants who sing beautiful music in Portuguese, organ, piano, sometimes it's guitars. But we've also adapted with the time. We have a choir that sings in English, but composed of different ethnicities. Um, one with older you know, generations, but we also have a children's choir in our 9 a.m. mass, in our youth group mass at 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. We incorporate the youth into it. So we try very hard to have music be a ministry to welcome people um, and have them worship. But I know Lisa also wanted to talk about the music ministry. I don't know if you want to add anything. I, I think you've with our new piano. I think you've you said yes. We've been investing in our music um, ministry because we recognize that music really opens people's hearts. And and for myself personally, that's how I came to God was through beautiful music at church. And um, we have a new wonderful grand piano at the church. Our pipe organ, uh, 1906 Kimball pipe organ. Is that correct? Um, has been fully refurbished in the last couple of years and we're starting to use it. In fact, on Sunday mornings uh, for our live stream, the first half hour before the mass begins, we have uh, different organists play um, for half an hour um, a prelude on the pipe organ to prepare people and the live stream starts then. Um, and and it's it means a lot but like you said we've got the um, multiple uh choirs as well and multi uh cultural um all of them they all add have something special to offer our community the other thing that i would say about music ministry is and it's very traditional in, in portugal it's marching bands so um, our church had one of the, of the first Portuguese marching bands in California right. when it was founded. Um, and so since then we have a, a big connection with several local marching bands. Uh -huh. um, actually, there's, uh, there are three within walking distance of the church. Uh, so they're very important, especially during the processions. Mm -hmm. So they accompany the processions and, and they're very much involved from that perspective. So that's something that's interesting to see that that's an old tradition that uh -huh. um, came to this parish all the way to 1914, and, and it's still going strong with... Do they have wonderful uniforms? They do, they do. And they all have different, you know, the three bands have different colors, <laughs> all right. so that you can distinguish who they're, um, which band they belong to. That is, that's wonderful. That is really, really wonderful. You know, you mentioned, was it um, the Holy Spirit feast? Is that when 
no, it was St. Uh, Elizabeth, right? The, when you feed people. Um, other outreach things that the parish does in terms of? Um, well, we do have St. Isabel's Kitchen, which I, I actually probably should have mentioned earlier. Um, I think it was in the 1980s, late 1980s, we established a kitchen to serve the poor um, in the spirit of, of St. Isabel. And so it's open every day and anyone can come to the kitchen. We offer them um, a meal that they can enjoy. We, as a community, have a very strong spirit to serve those who are in need, either through hunger or through ministry, obviously. But that's a really core component of, of our church and what we've done over the last few years, last few decades, I should say. So each celebration also usually involves a, a community dinner. Uh -huh. So that's really, so food is very important is, in the yeah. Portuguese community and the, and the Portuguese culture. You have this wonderful bread, I know. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so that's something that we try to connect. Again, people come to Mass, uh, let's say on a Saturday night, and then they head out to the Holy Spirit Hall next door, which by the way was founded by the same founders as our church. So they were very much connected from the beginning. And, and that's where usually the celebrations take place, the dinner celebrations take place. What would you say are some of the challenges? Most communities are facing challenges now. Not COVID is one, but what would you say are some of the challenges facing the community? Um, yeah, let me just ask you that. Sure. Um, you know, when the church was founded in 1919, it was facing some pretty insurmountable challenges. I just want to start there because I think it's a story of hope when we talk about the challenges we face today. They were facing World War I, they were facing communism and fascism, the Spanish flu epidemic that happened shortly after, uh, you know, when the church opened. Um, and then also throughout the years, they faced challenges because this church was created for Portuguese immigrants and the cycle of immigration was changing. So the immigrants came, they had children, the children adapted to more of an American lifestyle and there was a bit of a transition. Then in the 1970s, there was a new wave of Portuguese immigrants that came and who basically are the, the seeds of what we're seeing today in the church. But they also had children who became Americanized and some went to other churches. And so it's been a constant, I think, set of challenges for this parish because it is so closely tied to the immigrant community and what comes with that. But I think the beautiful story is that 100 years later, this building is still here, serving this community. It has transformed, but always kept its core, unique spirit of service to the community and worship to God. In 2020, obviously we face many more challenges. We face the same trends that other churches are battling with in terms of secularism and losing a lot of youth uh, not being want, wanting to associate themselves with a church. We face monetary and financial challenges. Um, but the way that our church has faced those is always working the hardest that we can work and trusting in God that he will provide and he will bring a future to our church and to our community. So as an example, for the challenge related to youth, um, we have uh, sort of this rejuvenation happening in the last few years with a youth club, with a mask with children, more families are coming and attending. We have a Bible study that began uh, with a hopefully future seminarian, a young adult. Um, and so we have this infusion of new talents. Um, vocations is also a challenge, but in the last couple of years, we've been blessed with uh, men in our church who are accepting the vocation and choosing to pursue studies to become priests in the future. So. We're very blessed. Yes, there are challenges, but nothing that we can't face with, you know, God's trust and spirit. Sure. And your pastor, I think, is one of the, I think he's the first pastor from the Diocese of San Jose, right? Yes, exactly. And that's one of the, as Lucy was talking about, the challenges of vocations. Um, seeing now somebody who used to be a parishioner here, now being our pastor, it, it's great because all the previous pastors who came here um, didn't come from, from this area, didn't come, f I mean, the, the ones through the 1980s all were Portuguese coming from Portugal with the exception of one who was Portuguese American. So um, all the other ones, basically, most of them did their studies in Portugal, might have finished their studies here. Um, so there was not a whole lot of vocations coming from within the parish, 
right? So there was one, one priest who then moved to the Diocese of Oakland who was from this parish. That's great, a, few, um, a couple of decades ago. And, uh, and now Father Antonio, we're so pleased to have him. He's, he's seen this parish as a parishioner, as an active parishioner, and now as a pastor. And the other thing too, Miguel, is he also, because he's from the diocese, had the connection, I think, with Five Wounds and the Church of San Jose is stronger because your previous pastors, as you say, they, they weren't from here. There is a difference when, you know, there's the parish family, but there's also the larger diocesan family. So, uh, and yeah, Father Antonio is, is very good that way. I mean, he's very outgoing. People just, you know, he's. And he's really risen to the occasion through the COVID with the live stream. He has been, every single day has come out and um, preached every single day. And he gives really a sermon, almost a sermon every day. Um, and it's been very well received. And he's really been the glue, I would say, that's really held the Portuguese community together. And I think through um, these last six months, we have seen so much energy and so much enthusiasm for this church from this community because of our live stream ministry that reaches out to all of our parishioners and to people all around, including around the world. Um, and Father Silveda has really risen to the occasion. Um, and it was a, a scary time, but because of our live stream, we've been able to meet our ADA. We've been able to raise funds that people would think you couldn't do, but every day he, he keeps reminding us of our obligation and, um, you know, and giving as an act of worship. I think that's such a great point and to highlight, you know, one of the challenges around having a centennial church is keeping it up. Sure. Uh, we, in the last, you know, five years, I would say, we have implemented under Father Silveda's le leadership, many, many restoration projects, including the beautiful stained glass windows that had to be reconstructed. Literally every single piece of glass taken off, reconstructed, put back in, with the protective shield. We um, are undertaking a lot of more renovation projects, including restoring the pews in the church and finishing the painting on the ceiling around the altar, for example. These are things that many people would say, wow, well, you're in the east side of San Jose. Uh, a lot of people consider this not a rich neighborhood. Um, and for the most part, we've had our financial hardships and struggles, but every single time, a pastor comes to the community and says, we need X amount of dollars to put a new roof, to paint the church, to restore the stained glass windows. People really sacrifice and give to preserve this beautiful monument. And I think that it's such a testament to those people who built it, that this generation can continue to preserve the beauty of the building, which is really the beauty of this community. And the challenges uh, we're facing now with COVID, um, it's not new to this, to this church, right? The Spanish flu, I 1918 and 19. I was thinking about that when you just begun. That's amazing. So uh, to, to, to actually read, having read the diary of Monsignor Ribeiro, where he documents what happens every day and why people initially came to mass, uh, to mass with masks, and then they were prevented from coming to mass. And obviously there was no such thing as live streaming right. 100 years ago. But that history of us now reliving almost those days, uh, it's just incredible to, to see that history and how the church was maintained. I mean, we're talking about the church wasn't even officially open right. yet in 1918. Um, and and being able to to really invest in such a building and the, the 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 story about him as he went to the archbishop and said this is the type of church i want to build and and the archbishop of san francisco said well make it shorter make it <laughs> you know shorter both in height as well as in length make it a smaller church and and he really had uh, this vision for a church that would stand out in east san jose uh, and he eventually was able to do that uh, 
he, he died in 1935 and the church was not paid off. Ah. So the next pastor who came here, his whole mission, and reminds me very much of Father Antonio's attitudes. He came with a very positive attitude. He was asked to come here. He didn't know how much he inherited in terms of death for, for, um, from the church. And he paid it off in just a few years. Wow. Um, there were events here and outdoor masses because there was not enough space inside the church with 10, 15, 20,000 people. Um, which nowadays it's almost unheard of. Oh, yeah. That is. Now, the community now, are there like recently arrived or is it mostly people who've been here for a long time? From the Portuguese community, it is mostly people who've been here for a long time. The wave of immigration has slowed down. Um, in terms of Portuguese immigrants coming here, we're seeing more um, people who are working for high-tech companies, for example, and they don't end up here at this church, they end up at other churches. So they're not called to come to a Portuguese church because they speak English very well, as an example. So what we're seeing is we continue to have this generation of strong Portuguese. We have some of their children who continue to come here, but we're also seeing a lot of other ethnicities uh, from the Filipino community, the Vietnamese community, the Mexican community, etc., come here and, and you know worship in the same place. But it is the Portuguese National Church. It is. Um, and there is a, a symbol in, in the front of the church, and it has a slogan, and it says, together, let us unite and work for God and country. And so it is very much a national church. We're here for God, but we're also here for the country, quote unquote. Um, but if you think, you read through what, what Monsignor Ribeiro wrote, when he talked about country and he thought about his country, Portugal, he thought about, he wrote about the noble missionaries that went to Morocco and to China and to the you know, West Coast to spread God's message. That's how he thought about country is this Portuguese zeal to share God's faith. Um, so it's, it's very much stamped inside of the soul of, of this community. You know, coming here from, from the Protestant faith, all the things that were missing, all the things that were missing in my life, in my, in my um, Christian life, I walk it and I found them here. And the traditions are so beautiful I can recall the very first time I've, uh, that I was here for Good Friday after the procession, which unless you've seen it, you can't, I can't even describe the beauty of it. And I was standing in front of the church, looking around with tears pouring down my face. And I said to Selena Belim, head of the Altar Society, I can't believe I was deprived of this my whole life. So powerful. It's so beautiful, and these traditions, God willing, will continue for the life of this church, which I hope long time. Well, I would think you've been at it a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> and I think to Lisa's point, um, Holy Week is extremely special at, at this at this parish. Um, I mean, it actually starts two weeks before with Palm Sunday, um, so that's very special. But especially Holy Week and getting to Good Friday um, and then Saturday is just amazing. To be inside the church with candles in our hands, with candles in our hands and then all the lights come on. Um, it's just amazing to see the beauty of, of, of the church at that moment. Um, I think every year we do that, um, I feel something different, something more than the previous years, even though I've been coming here for many years. Um, so there's something extremely special about the place. Um, and so when we look at, and we talked about, and Lucia talked about the reverse procession this year, to see the reaction from people, uh, not just the people on the street, but the people uh, who were watching on, uh, that we were live streaming, I mean, it was a miracle, to be honest with you, to be able to put three cameras together on iPhones with a s spotty internet connection around this neighborhood that we were able to do that procession. Um, but 
God was with us and so was Our Lady. And so I think there's a lot of special moments and, and I remember us getting um, back to church. It was a very cloudy day and the sun comes out as, as the statue arrives in front of the church. Um, some people believe in miracles, uh, but I have to say it was just, it's some of those moments that uh, entices us to come back and, and dedicate our time uh, to, to this parish. There was a rainbow over the church. It went all the way over the church and it hadn't been raining <laughs> when we got back. That's it one. <laughs> I can imagine. I think one other thing that you made me realize is we haven't talked about this church has so many statues and nowadays you know a lot of modern churches don't have as many statues um, and the traditions that we have for you know, for Lent, for Good Friday, Holy Week, for Our Lady of Fatima, the procession, for even Father Antonio would say his favorite feast of all is the uh, Feast of St. Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. Um, you know, these statues, we, it's a, it's a physical symbol of, of the saints who intercede for us. It's a physical symbol of something that happened in the past. And there's a lot of power when Our Lady of Sorrows comes out and Jesus uh, statue comes out as well and we process you know on Good Friday there's a lot of power when the cross on the altar is covered and Jesus's resurrected statue shows up so there's a lot of art history here that I think can inspire those who are looking for more meaning and uh, more history about what where our faith came from it takes a lot of volunteers too to pull all these things off I was gonna ask about a lot that of too. love in their hearts and a lot of volunteers. Because you do, I was talking with Lisa earlier that you do have uh, some emerging ministries, like she was talking about the Newlyweds group. Yes, the, the Newlyweds group. And uh, actually, we're gonna be starting a youth group after the, um, after the COVID ends. It was gonna start before. Uh, they were just getting started with it. Uh, one of our uh, seminarians, future seminarians, and another uh, gentleman want to do that. And we're, we were really excited about it and then COVID happened. But our church is very beautiful. A lot of people get married here. So it makes a lot of sense because a lot of people, they come get married in a church and then they never go again. So Father Antonio Silveda likes to um, invite young people to join and it's interesting to hear them tell the story how I was just going to get married in the church. I wasn't going to come back, you know, and here they are coming back and getting involved. And actually, um, one of them is on one of our councils now. And, um, and, uh, so it's, it's really nice. What else do we have? We've got, you've already discussed the, um, the Bible study and our, some of our CCD students are coming to the, uh, teenagers or, are uh, in, interested in the Bible study and, and coming. Um, and we, do, we have a lot of charity physical work. You know, for example, there are some amazing ladies who bake sweet bread who are in their 70s and 80s, but they'll get up at two o'clock in the morning and go and make, I don't know, hundreds of loaves of sweet bread to raise money for, for things, you know? And sometimes, you know, there's the ministry of like the Bible study and studying the word. And then there's a lot of people who come and donate their talents, baking, flower arranging. Um, we are going to install a new system for live streaming and there's going to be someone who's gonna donate an equivalent of whatever it is, $7,000 of his work to do electrical uh, you know, filling. And so I think that that's, that's amazing that so many people come together and, and are able to offer their talents in different ways. We had uh, 75 years of bees in the um, of, of, of bees up there in the um, bell tower, and um, last year, right before the centennial, they were removed. It was a big job. It took three different bee um, bee companies before we got the right one. Two different cranes, and uh, in the spirit of our church, the ladies made honey, I, and sold the honey. So it That's was wonderful. it was. You know, that is the spirit of this church. And uh, we were selling the jars at the 100th anniversary and they sold out really fast. And what did we call it? Holy honey? Holy honey. Holy yes, honey. holy honey. That's right. 
And sometimes church is about that invitation. Come help me make the sweet bread or come be part of this ministry. Sometimes I feel like we don't ask enough. Um, heart, people don't say no a lot when they're asked, but it's so easy for them to come and leave if you're not engaging them. And I think that's part of what we're trying to do now um, is carry on that spirit and make sure that we're reaching out to people, give them the opportunity to really be the body of Christ in the church. And one interesting thing is, um, you know, we've had administrators and pastors who came here from other churches and looked at the collection, for example, and were startled that, well, it should be more. Um, but I think what people desire here is something tangible. So as we've been talking about, when there, there's, you know, we needed half a million dollars to restore the stained glass windows, it was raised very quickly. We needed almost 200,000 for the, a new roof. It was raised very quickly. So when, when people know where the money is going, they donate. And it's amazing to see that, you know, and it's not just, you know, the, the well-to-do families in, in our community in this parish. It's, you know, the old lady who's a, a widow who puts that, that donation in to help. It's the people who leave in, in their uh, testaments, you know, and their wills to, to leave something for the church. So there's that connection that people have with, with the church. And I can tell you, my experience was, you know, I moved to California, I was 15 when I moved to California from Portugal. And um, I was not a practicing Catholic. And it took this church to, to really help me become a practicing Catholic. Um, and, and so that connection, it was the connection with the pastor at the time, it was the connection with the, the actual building and with the people, and the connection with the culture as well. I just thought of something. Does this parish connect at all with the Portuguese community at St. Clair? Like for festivals or? In the past there have been times where we share choirs and certainly the communities mix. For example, we'll go to their Holy Spirit fest that they'll come to ours. Um, so there is definitely some mingling in the community. But I, I guess it could be a little closer. For example, I mean, we could share um, a priest, for example, <laughs> you know, that could do the Portuguese mass in St. Clair's. And here I've suggested that many times. Uh, so and especially since we're in the same diocese, right? So it would be and we're just a few miles away. Um, it would be a good thing, I think, to, for us uh, to do, to be closer. Um, I think there's, you know, one of the things that I would add is, um, and I mentioned earlier, Monsignor's vision, build it and they will come. He didn't want to get it in, in the way at St. Clair's, which already was in existence. He didn't want to get in the way of St. John the Baptist in Milpitas, which was a Portuguese community at the time. And he wanted to do something special. And so he picked a place that, yeah, there were a, a few Portuguese ranchers and there was a Portuguese, uh, some orchards around here, but there wasn't a strong co community. And so he gathered uh, people from the Portuguese community, 318 families from around, most of them from the South Bay, from different parts of the South Bay to really get together and establish the parish. Um, and then the biggest donor for the church is actually somebody from uh, Marin County. Um, so if you know Freitas Parkway in Marin County, it's named after that big donor, Manuel Freitas. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to see the connection that he was able to make. He would get it in, on, on the train and go to Bakersfield. There's a a, a Portuguese uh, shepherd who came across oil in his fields in Bakersfield overnight became extremely rich. So Monsignor went there at least twice to ask for a donation. The, the guy gave, he gave money to the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, but not to the Portuguese church in San Jose. So there's a lot of really interesting stories about the challenges again that, that the, the parish has had over the years. Um, and, you know, sometimes we think, well, this is a bigger challenge today than it was 
many years ago, but then we reread some of the stories of, of what happens um, and we sometimes think otherwise. We probably should have mentioned Monsignor Hidev did not speak English. He struggled mightily to learn the language. It was something he complained a lot about in his diaries. So I think it's also something that a lot of immigrant families um, can empathize with. Sure. And yet what he was able to build with the community is the story of Silicon Valley, right? People who come here with a dream and can make it happen regardless of their roots and, and capabilities. And what a gift to the Church of San Jose. You know, I just, uh, I've learned a lot and our people are gonna learn a lot. Uh, before we finish, anything else that we should bring up? And of course, as soon as we leave, we'll be thinking about all the course, things that we should yes. <laughs> uh, There's one thing I remembered I forgot to talk about our music ministry. We were really helped tremendously by the diocese by uh, Christopher Webb. Um, he really has helped us since we decided to um, to upgrade our uh, our, music, uh, our music. And he worked tirelessly with us. So I do want to mention our connection there. And also with uh, the Family Life Center, um, uh, Annabella and Joel. And actually, <laughs> Joel and his family actually come to this church. Um, uh, at least they come here on Sundays, and I'm pretty much sure they're parishioners now. Um, but uh, the Family Life uh, Center has given us resources for the newlywed group and been very encouraging. Um, so uh, we knew Father, um, Father John Hurley and now Joel in, in that role and of course Annabella who's now um, Bishop Cantu's assistant so that's wonderful I, I just I think we should highlight um, a thank you to the diocese and the different bishops that have helped our community through its many years of journey for example a lot of challenges with how do we find a Portuguese speaking priest who can relate to this community who can lead this community and over, over the history of the church, the bishops have always been very supportive of our community and helped us in many ways. So I think it's important to highlight too. Well, you're an important part of the, the diocese. So thank you so much for this time. Um, this has just been wonderfully enlightening and um, I've enjoyed it a great deal. Thank, thank you. you